Friends, today you're in for a treat. We've got Dan Butner on, author of The Blue Zones, American Kitchen, 100 Recipes to Live to 100. You are going to love this episode. He went to all five Blue Zones and he figured out what they are doing, what they are eating to live long, healthy lives. You're going to be mind blown. Dan, anything to add? Yes. You can live an extra 10 years and I'm going to show you how. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Hello, hello, friends. It's going to be a great day. And that's because we are going to learn how to eat to have a long, healthy life. Oh, it's such a good episode. I'm so excited. Okay, let's start with the quote of the day. A long, healthy life is no accident. It begins, begins, it begins with good genes, but it also depends on good habits. And that is from Dan Butner, friends. He is the author of The Blue Zones American Kitchen. He is on the show today. We had an incredible chat, me and Bobo, uh, both of us, if you can see us on YouTube right now. Uh, if you can't, just imagine a scruffy little guy in the background. Heel Squad, so excited to have you back today. We are certainly going to get better today because we are going to know a lot more and we're going to do it together. Welcome to any new listeners. This is what we do here every single day. Thank you for being with us. So Dan Butner is an Explorer National Geographic Fellow award-winning journalist, producer, New York Times bestselling author. He discovered the five places in the world, dubbed the Blue Zones, where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Now, I don't know if he officially discovered them. I think we've known about them, Kelsey. Yes, but he dubbed, he coined the term Blue Zone. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, there we go. Shout out. Um, Heel Squad, I'm so excited for you to go on this little health journey with us. Let's take a listen. So tell me a little bit about this lovely book, The Blue Zones, American Kitchen. What inspired you to do this? Um, and and was Grease Root your number one favorite? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> Acadia specifically. Well, so 680 million Americans will die this year prematurely. And in the last 10 years, more people Wait, Did you died. just say 680 million 680,000. Oh, I was like, wait, I, that's crazy. We'd all be gone. Okay, 680,000. Yeah. Wow. 680,000 Americans will die this year prematurely from eating the standard American diet. Those are CDC numbers, not Dan Butner numbers. In the last 10 years, we've lost more people to the way we eat than all the people died in all the wars since World War I. And we're not, we're not giving it enough attention. And over the course of the past 20 years, working for National Geographic, I found these blue zones and I found a diet, you know, a meta-analysis, uh, how people who are making it to 100 actually ate, actually eat to live to be 100. And this book is an American manifestation of that. It takes the, the dietary trend or the, basically the blue zone diet, but, it, uh, but I went out and found the best American chefs uh, to bring that diet to life in a, in a variety of different ethnicities and sort of flavor profiles. And so what was it that you discovered in these blue zones? What were people eating? And so what's the wanna... difference, right? Like, cause they might be eating dairy there and they might be okay. Obviously our dairy is a little contaminated. <laughs> yeah, no, you have a point. There is a contamination and, you know, Meat is very different here than it is in, in say, Icaria or Greece. Um, our meat is very high in saturated fat and uh, omega-6 fatty acids because it's fed grain instead of grass-fed. So that you do have a, a bit of a point. But um, in order to do this responsibly, uh, there, it's a chain of events. So the first thing, you have to find places where people are really living the longest, and to do that, we worked two and a half years with demographers, went through worldwide census data, and we found these five places where we know people are making it to age 100 at higher rates. But the more important statistic is they're not getting sick from diabetes, heart disease, cancers of the GI tract, dementia. They're largely avoiding these diseases, so they're living to the capacity of the human machine. So once you find people who've achieved the outcomes we want, then we start looking at what they've done over the past hundred years. Before you go and, to that, Dan, my first thought is, did they live to a hundred and have quality of life, right? Because 
when I think about life, I'm like, oh gosh, I don't want to live that long because I don't want to be suffering at the end because that's what you kind of see here. Right. So the answer is they're living wonderful lives and it's a different than here. Uh, so I also wrote a cover story for National Geographic on happiness and was afforded access I, to worldwide. I just threw that away. That was years ago. Go Wait, go pick that out of the garbage now. Oh my God. I've had that forever. And I cleaned out my office. I'm like, Maria, you've read this 50 times. You don't need it anymore. And it's been on my desk for years. Like it's, well, it was, how long ago was it? That was 2018. Not Thank you. Long. I'm not crazy. It had all yeah. the smiley faces on it. <laughs> yeah. That was you? That was me. So, You're huge, uh, Dan. <laughs> well, I'm no Maria, but, uh, you know, I'll take it. But, but um, the, point, the point being that um, this, so all blue zones are in the top fifth, top 20%. So they're among the happy. And the reality is what we learn are the same things that get you to a healthy age, 95. And by the way, the average person listening to us right now, the capacity, I'm looking at you now. I'm looking at you. you watching us. You, the, you, the, your body's capacity is about 95, not really 100. And the same things that will get you to a healthy 95 are the same things that make the journey pleasurable. So it's having a sense of purpose. It's having a good social network of people around you who take care of you. It's having an environment that sheds stress. Um, it's walkability, living in walkable places. So yes, the same things in blue zones anyway, uh, the things that uh, will get you to hundred are also the things that make you happy. I like the list of happiness. I think that's uh, those are all doable things, but we forget sometimes that um, sense of purpose you know, sometimes you lose that and you don't realize and, and you have to find it again, or even social networks anytime in my crazy 20 hour a day, you know, seven day a week work weeks that I was pulling, there were moments when I'd be so sad. And my husband's like, you need your friends, go see your friends. I'm like, yeah. Oh, oh, you're right. Like, thanks for the reminder. But those are really important things. So probably more important than you realize there. If you, um, so to write that story for geographic, I found the statistically uh, um, happiest places. And I was able to get, you know, I worked with Gallup, the World Poll and the Latino Barometer, and I was afforded uh, access to this, this huge uh, uh, cache of data that represented 95% of the human population. And rather than hearsay or positive psychology or some, you know, test that was done with 30 students, um, I was able to mathematically find what are the things that correlate with the happiest people. It's a process called regression analysis. And the number one thing that most um, assures that you're going to live a happy life is having strong social connections. It's, it's stronger than money. It's stronger than living in Bel Air. It's stronger than uh, being beautiful, being famous. Uh, the second most important thing, guess what it is, Maria? Second biggest predictor of happiness. Uh, well, you said sense of purpose. Second, well, purpose is in there, but it's uh, it's health, and health yeah. is part of, and purpose is part. Of, so keep it. So if you want to invest in happiness, if you really want to be happy, what you do is you put effort into a small group of people around you, and care about them in a bad day, and and. Um, have meaningful conversations and support them. And the second thing is spend the time of every day to get your physical activity and to eat right. Yeah, so I happiness. have a question. Go ahead. So, so, and this is a little bit personal, but um, when you lived in LA, did you feel like you had that strong social network? Because that's why I've wanted to move for the last couple of years. I'm realizing as my health has deteriorated in some ways, right? Health has become a thing in the last six years for me, which is why I have this show. I've realized I don't have um, the type of social network I want here. I have amazing friends. Everyone lives 40 minutes away. Everybody's yeah, so far here. I want to be able to walk across the street, walk down the street, see my friends, be able to hang out at their house. There's no hanging out at people's houses when you live in LA. That's exactly right. In, in these blue zones, every time 
people step out their front door, they're bumping into their friends. They live in constantly walkable communities. And that's not, the, you, can, it's, you can find that in America. And there's probably some neighborhoods in LA. You know, I think if you live in Manhattan Beach, for example, or, or um, you know, maybe Venice, where, um, but it's, it's hard to make friends there. Uh, it's hard to make friends with your neighbors. So, yeah, um, you know, just going down the happiness list, the, the, the fourth, the third biggest predictor of your happiness or lack thereof is where you live. If you follow unhappy immigrants from places like uh, Moldavia or when they go to Denmark or uh, uh, parts ha unhappy parts of Africa when they go to Canada, which is a happy place, nothing else changes about them. They're the same person, same sexual orientation, you know, married, same education level. But within one year, they start reporting the happiness level of their adoptive home which in most cases that can mean a doubling of your happiness and there's which nothing which helps your health which helps your health that's right if you're if you're um, in the top 20% of the happiest people in America it's worth 6 years of life expectancy over being in the bottom 20% so again happiness and longevity are like this you cannot you can't pull them apart if you pull them apart they both drop so uh uh, and this is very different than the Silicon Valley longevity that talk about remdesivir or resveratrol or metformin or, um, uh, you know, testosterone or anti-aging, which is all that's trying to do is address the appearance and address, you know, different parts of your body. The happiness we talk about in blue zones are this, this holistic happiness that would give an average American an uh, probably 14 years of, of solid, enjoyable, connected, purposeful life expectancy. And that's, that's the value proposition I peddle in my books. I, I really like that value proposition. And it's interesting because I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And I believe that you are the sign that just came into my life to say, yeah, you probably should pack your bags and go. Because I have been in, in a situation here in LA where I have stayed longer than I've wanted to because of my health, because I have amazing doctors here and I have, you know, 20 years of relationships with them. So when I need something, I can get something quickly. And my fear has been, if I move somewhere else, reestablishing those connections will hurt my health because it'll take so long. Um, but then I thought to myself, I'm like, but if I'm happy, then maybe I won't have as many health situations and you're right. You're here to confirm that, you know, just not to be too prescriptive for you, but you might consider Santa Barbara, which is only 75 miles to the North. So you can still keep your relationship. Santa Barbara is a very happy city, you know, on the Gallup it's, it's, I think 11th happiest in America, very walkable, great, um, a food environment. There's four universities. So there's lots of sort of intellectual stimulation, your easy access to recreation and, you know, 75 minutes, you can run down and get a fix of, you know, your high octane friends. And, I like um, that. okay. I, I, I you know, I, I kind of picture there cause I used to live there and, um, you know, I loved it. I loved that as well. I lived in and a very felt... walkable neighborhood. I, my, I knew all my neighbors. We had happy hours. and pop I like that. I used to have yeah. that for a hot minute here. And then everyone left in COVID. And so I'm like, wait, no, I don't have that. I created it. It was fun. But well, offline, I'll tell you the exact street to move to. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so we've got the, the list of things that make us happy. Let's talk a little bit about the actual diet because, you know, the Mediterranean diet has always been um, touted as the number one diet. But I know when I go to Greece, we're still eating bread and we're still eating cheese pies and we're eating feta cheese. So tell me what you discovered in, in these blue zones diet wise. So first, let me say where the five blue zones are. You have, uh, we talked about Icaria, Greece, but there's also Sardinia, Italy, but this is a Bronze Age culture that lives up in the highlands of Sardinia. Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, uh, Okinawa, Japan, and among the Seventh-day Adventists in, in Loma Linda, California. So there are five of them. 
And these, they're very disparate cultures. We have a blue zone in California? Loma Linda, it's, but it's only among the Seventh-day Adventists. It's, a, it's an Adventist oh. community. And, you know, they're, they sort of play by a different set of rules than most of California. Okay. Um, but so our approach at National Geographic was to find the common denominators. And if you want to know what a 100-year-old ate to live to be 100, you can't just ask them what they've been eating lately. For example, let's just do a quick fun thing. Maria, what did you have for lunch a week ago Tuesday? I can look at my food journal. Yes. Is that a most cheat? Most people can't, but that's my report. <laughs> that, I mean, you made my point. Yeah. You can't, no clue. Thing is you, you, you can't ask a 100-year-old what they were eating because they don't remember. Yeah. But uh, dietary surveys uh, were, were conducted by the government in every case or universities. And, and they go back 80 years. So my team found 155 dietary surveys done in all five blue zones. And then with the help of Harvard, we did what's called a meta-analysis, which is sort of like an averaging against all, you know, all five blue zones over the past 80 years. Um, and here's what we found. And that, by the way, we were discovering what they were eating when they were little kids and what they were eating when they were middle aged and newly retired. So throughout their entire life, 90 to 95 percent whole food plant based, uh, very high carbohydrate diet. But I'm going to quickly um, clarify here. Carbohydrates, the word is probably the worst word in the American dictionary because it means totally opposite things depending on how you use it. Mm -hmm. Simple carbs like donuts and cookies and candy and soda pops, they're the most toxic thing in our, in our food environment. Worst, absolute worst. There's no redeeming qualities unless you're starving to death. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, greens and nuts and, and whole grains and tubers and, and beans those are the five pillars of the blue zones. Those are all complex carbohydrates and protein sources. And, and um, those are the pillars of every longevity diet in the world. They did eat meat, but only five times per month. So a little bit more than once a week. And um, some cheese, no cow's dairy, which is interesting. Yes, they ate a little bit of feta. But uh, traditionally, that was small mouths, you know, because it's very rich. It's not like a pizza where you got to put a pound of mozzarella on it. If you know, you know, a slab of mozzarella this size, you know, it's, you got a salad and boy, that was convenient. That was there. Kind of looks like that. <laughs> um, little pecorino. Um, they, uh, a few, maybe two or three eggs a week, but these are, you know, free range. They're not the industrial raised uh, pesticide laden, filthy eggs that we get at a gas station. And, um, when it comes to drinking, they're drinking six glasses of water a day, um, uh, herbal teas, brown teas, and then um, coffee, black, and um, uh, a little bit of wine. Uh, we see, uh, you can Google it, Blue Zones Wine, which is a continental wine, um, uh, highest levels of polyphenols of any known wine in the world. So they're drinking a little bit of that as well. Wow. I mean, I've seen it live when I've been in Greece. Um, I feel like the wine, the reason that that's okay is because everything else in the diet is so good. And also it brings them joy. Yes, it does. I, I, you know, I'm very familiar with the recent scientific studies that suggest that there's no, there's no healthy level of alcohol. But I will also tell you in all blue zones, people are drinking a little bit every day. They're enjoying a glass or two of wine with meals. They're having, they're going to parties and they're drinking maybe a little bit more than one or two glasses. And they're still making it into their mid nineties. They're still outliving Americans um, with vital lives and they're, they're staying sharp to the very end. So um I mean, I'm one, I drink a little bit. I'll continue to drink a little bit because it enriches my life. So how did your life change after you did the research for this book? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a plant-based eater now. I don't eat meat anymore. Very clear that meat is uh, associated with cancer and 
heart disease and diabetes. Um, I, I'm a naturally social person, but I actually used to throttle down my social inclinations um, because, you know, I thought I should get more work done. And now I know it's better for me. So I, I, I'm out, I go out every night out with different people. And, um, you know, I set three world record for, for bicycling. I was a pretty hardcore athlete. And I, you know, it's become very clear to me that gentle, low-intensity physical activity is far better for the long run. So now the most intense thing I do is play pickleball. Um, I love I, pickleball. I actually rushed home from a game to talk to you here. I said, yes, I, <laughs> it's a new craze. And then I have an ocean right out in front of my, uh, my place here. I go swim in that. And, uh, you know, I've, I, I realize um, – Family. I mean, this sounds sort of like a cliche, but we know that people who live in strong families, and what I mean by that, the families that keep their aging parents nearby, you invest in your partner, you invest in your kids. It's a virtuous circle. It's probably worth six years of life expectancy for everybody in that virtuous, virtuous circle to be close and connected and mutually supportive. The other thing, we're talking purpose. And I know it sounds like a facile thing, but if you can... If you could take purpose and put it in a capsule, it'd be a blockbuster drug. Uh, Robert Butler, who was the founding director of the National Institutes on Aging, it's a huge governmental organization, part of the NIH. He found that people who could articulate their sense of purpose were living about eight years longer than people were rudderless. Maria, there is no pill, there's no supplement, there's no genetic intervention, there's nothing you can get on the internet, there's no superfood, there's no diet that will give you eight years of life expectancy. So taking the time to know what you're good at, what you like to do, and an outlet for those passions is one of the best things you can do for your overall longevity. And I can keep, I can keep telling you why, et cetera, and so forth. But um, No, I want to know why. I want to know all of it. Well, you know, the, uh, so we all know that s- stress in our life creates inflammation. And inflammation uh, is the root of every major age related disease diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, you s- wrinkle your skin, shrink your brain. Uh, so if you wake up every morning, you know exactly what you're going to do with your day. Um, you eliminate that that existential stress. Uh, in America, I happen to know this from Gallup data, only 31% of Americans actually find purpose at work. That means the, the other 69% are showing up every day and phoning it in. And um, people with a strong sense of purpose, especially when you get older, uh, you're more likely to take your medicines. You're more likely to t- um, stay physically active. You're less likely to smoke. You're less likely to drink too much. So it's, uh, you're more likely to be engaged in a community. There's all sorts of things flow from being, uh, knowing your passions and having a way um, to put, to be able to put to work the things that you do best every day. That's purpose. What are some of the things also that they don't do that we do, right? Like I think about the obsession we've had with plastic water bottles, right? You know, getting the little bottles, putting them in the fridge and grab and go and throw away. Um, are they using those there? How are they getting their water source in the well, blue zones? Increasingly, yes. But not, not, not to the extent we do. You bring up a very good point. They live in a cleaner environment. There's no question. And, you know, their, their, uh, their food isn't laced with Roundup. There's less arsenic in their food. There are fewer pesticides. Their air is cleaner. Their water is probably cleaner. Uh, but, you know, I could not measure that at a population level. So even though I could note it anecdotally, I can't, I can't tell you with sort of science that, you know, National Geographic would require mm-hmm. uh, me to say. Uh, I will say, you know, and here's something that will shock most people. People in all four of the five blue zones live considerably below the American poverty line. These are poor people, but that poverty, you know, we're, we're so obsessed with comfort and convenience in this country. You know, we we're never more than 10 steps away from a bar or bag of chips. Starbucks. 
Yeah, we're always eating yeah. and um, the, the, we constantly live in an environment that's somewhere between 72 and 74 degrees. Uh, we drive everywhere. Uh, I, I, in one of the blue zones, in, in all the blue zones, every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, they're walking. They have a garden out back, so they're getting a lot of their food. They're, you know, it's a daily watering and weeding. Um, the temperature changes, and because of that, they um, they, they 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 do things to, um, uh, I guess, keep their own comfort. But it's it's they've all gone through periods of hunger, by the way, in all those zones, which we know epigenetically favors longevity. So. Um, yeah, you know, I think I think it's our obsession with comfort and, and ease is probably not not uh, not not good for us. Yeah. Well, also, you know, those comforts are contaminating our environment too. So they're not just comforts for us. Then they actually then co continue to pollute our air and water and all of these places and sources. You're right. So it's, it's kind of a, a double, a double whammy. Um, how did you get off of meat and, and clean out your diet? What did you replace meat with? Beans. If you're, so the, the, the blue zone of American kitchen, you, you just held up in the, in the blue zone kitchen for each of those. I, I went and found chefs that are cooking diets of longevity and you know, they couldn't afford to have meat every day. So the, and by the way, it was always women. Women were always the sort of culinary genius in these blue zones. They have learned how to make peasant food taste delicious. And, um, you know, for example, there's a recipe in there for uh, uh, a chickpea that I learned in Icaria. And, um, you know, we chickpeas, you know, they can be kind of boring or we put them in hummus. But uh, the way I, the Icarian women do it, they would, they would um, uh, boil the chickpeas and then they take, chop up onions and they knead the on onions, knead them and make them crush them under their hand. And then they make sort of a savory broth out of rosemary and a few other things. And then they uh, slow roast these of it, these uh, beans, the full rest. I'm not telling you the full recipe, but they just had these ingenious, like who thinks about kneading the onions? Well, it turns out when you knead the onions, uh, the sugars come out and they caramelize and they impart this wonderful caramelized rosemary deliciousness and baking the beans instead of boiling the beans makes them more meat like. So um, there are, you know, meat is basically protein, fat, and salt. And it doesn't take any culinary uh, expertise to throw that in a pan and fry it up. Uh, the recipes developed in the blue zones over centuries and sometimes millennia, that's a trial and error. That's, a, that's accumulated genius over time. And there's literally dozens of different textures. There's a, a symphony of flavors that actually come through when you're not napalming your taste buds with fat and salt, like you do with you're eating a burger. And um, many of these meals have one fifth the caloric density of a hamburger, but five times more nutrients. Uh, like there's a, an Okinawan stir fry, for example, which, you know, has this wonderful tofu in it and these, the uh, greens and herbs and wonderful spices. And there's, yeah, there's a little bit of oil, but you know, you have a lunch, that looks like a you know compost pile, delicious compost pile, and you're eating, eating. And you think you're stuffing yourself, but you're fewer calories than eating a you know a, a four chicken wings, and uh, way healthier for you. So, um, I know that's a long-winded answer to your question, how I got off of meat. But I also, and probably the best thing you do is make friends with a, uh, a vegan. I actually dated a vegan <laughs> for, a, for a while. And she showed me how to make plant-based foods taste good. She she knew all the great restaurants in LA, um, um, uh, Crossroads, for example, and Gracias Madre, and and uh, Cafe Gratitude. Those are you know hipster, fabulous. You you're not sacrificing anything at any of those rest, restaurants, and um, you're 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 not eating you know a slab of dead animal. 
Yeah. I, um, I quit meat years ago after a Tony Robbins seminar when he showed me the process of like what meat is and how it's kind of before it gets to us in the supermarket. I was like, yep, I'm done. But then sure I got really is. anemic and I had to reintroduce red meat into my life and, um, and was too busy to figure out how to kind of get that supplementation. But, um, was, did, my, were you lacking vitamin B12? I've had that or issue iron? as well. Yeah. 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 If, if you go plant-based, that's the one supplement you do need to take is B12, but you should be anemic. There's so, there's something else going on. It's not because you quit meat. There's something else that happened. I guarantee you. Yeah. Well, uh, there is, there's all kinds of autoimmune stuff that we're dealing with, which is what led me to cut sugar and um, carbs in the bad carbs, not the good carbs. Um, so I laughed when you said that, cause it is a loaded question. Why would they call it carbs? Because the two there's good, really good ones and there are bad ones. So why would we call good and bad the same? Makes no sense. We, we need new vocabulary, but you and me, that'll be our campaign. Yeah. I love it. Um, and I quit coffee cause I was having like stomach stuff and I've got more energy and I feel so much better. The meat is the next thing that has to be cut. Um, but I saw here that there was a, a statistic replacing one serving per day of red meat with a serving of nuts would reduce total mortality by approximately 20%. And that's a professor from Harvard. That's crazy. Walter Willett, I bet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. And I have had the benefit of my mom being an amazing cook. Her grandfather, my grandfather was a chef in Greece. So my mom was that person who could make vegetables taste amazing. So we wrote a cookbook together that was all fast, easy, healthy recipes because all of my friends were like, we, we don't know how to make this stuff. And for you, you've now had the benefit of being exposed to this. So then your passion lies there and then you can get into it. For the everyday person, it seems like a mountain to climb to change your diet so drastically. So what advice do you have for the average person listening that knows they want to do all of this is hearing what you're saying about our health and how, you know, tragic these, you know, different things are to our diet and to our health. What do you say to them to be able to make those changes? The most important ingredient in any longevity recipe is not tofu or turmeric or bitter melon or anything. It's taste. Because if you're not going to do it for a long time, don't, don't waste your time. This is why diets are a waste of time and usually a waste of money. What you do is you pick up your book or pick up the Blue Zones American Kitchen. Sit down with your child or your family. Thank you for holding that up. You're Age welcome. through it and find... Uh, let's just say 12 recipes that you think that look delicious to you. And we tried, that's full of national geographic photography. We made sure we tried to make sure that. The yeah, they're beautiful. Looked, well, it's looked. funny. Cause normally I have my tabs for all the things I'm going to make, but I waited so that it would look pretty when I popped it up. But oh, <laughs> three sisters, Cherokee succotash sounds amazing, but it has corn. I thought corn was bad. Corn is one of the best longevity foods in the world. Uh, the, the longest lived, the longest lived people. I was just in Costa Rica last week, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. 70% of their diet are three foods, corn made into tortillas, squash, and beans for the last hundred years. So I'm not, you know, processed corn, Doritos, Fritos. Yes. But sweet corn is fine. Um, or corn, if you go, you know, I, I'm, I, I have no connection to this, but I happen to know if you go to Trader Joe's and you buy their uh, their corn tortillas, those are wonderful, whole grain corn. They're complex carbohydrates. They have uh, three of essential amino acids. They, they have vitamins, folate. Um, so no, corn is a good thing. Corn, you know, most of the corn grown in America is used for processed food and for you know, to feed animals. And that's probably why it gets a bad name. That's what um, I thought. I thought the corn was bad for the animals. And then that's bad for us too. 
Well, if if all you ate was corn, you'd be a it'd be a problem. But having a serving of corn a day is not going to be any problem. Uh, you know, animals that's all they eat, but corn or maybe soybeans. Mm-hmm. So um, we eat lots of things, but no uh, corn. Uh, people should disabuse themselves the idea of corn is bad for them. Oh, Real God, corn, I said that. corn on the cob. Um, yeah. But um, I did actually, if you go to my Instagram post, I'm at Dan Butner. I, I did a fairly lengthy post over the weekend about corn and, and why we, we get misguided, and why it's, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, corn is a good thing. I know I cut you off. I think you were going to talk about Costa Rica. Well, Costa Rica, so... This is a good example. Uh, Nicoya, Costa Rica, they, they have half the rate of middle age mortality that we have in the United States. So they're about three times more likely to reach an age healthy age 95 than we are in America. And they spend one fifteenth the amount we do on health care. In fact, the poorest people there have the longest telomeres. So they're, the poorest people are biologically youngest. We ought to be paying attention to that. How do they do it? Well, I believe it's this three sisters diet, bean, squash, and corn tortillas. Uh, very strong sense of family. Uh, it happens to be a, a very dry environment. Um, uh, they, uh, but they also have this fantastic public health. Uh, Costa Rica is not a place you want to go get some cutting edge cancer drug. They're going to have your health records. They're going to screen you for high blood pressure, for diabetes, for depression. They're going to go in your backyard, look for signs of infectious disease, standing water. They're going to go in your kitchen and look at the way you've been eating. And they're going to catch a disease 15 years before it ends up in the emergency room. America, we just wait for it to show up in the emergency room. And then, you know, that's when the healthcare system kicks in and charges a bajillion dollars to treat you with you know, some drug regimen or surgery or some treatment. Costa Rica, they invest in getting people healthy, keeping people healthy. A pregnant mother, you could be dirt poor, have nothing. The moment you're pregnant, uh, at the local um, health outpost, free food, free education, free health care till that baby is born. They're going to make sure you know the right right vaccinations. You're going to you're going to be shown how to feed that child the right way, so the child gets a good start in life, and and uh, much lower rates of of uh, infant mortality than even the United States. That has a big impact on overall life expectancy too, as well. And kids get off to a good start, so they're they're smarter in school, they're um, they're healthier, they grow up to be more productive citizens. Uh, they make better voting choices, I, I would argue. Costa Rica is a very well-governed country. So, you know, it all starts, I think, with um, thinking about keeping people healthy in the first place rather mm-hmm. than this the industry we have in America that literally costs our country $4.2 trillion annually uh, at, at um, you know, just waiting for us to get sick. Can't yep. wait for them to get sick, and we're going to get them on this – hundred thousand dollar a month obesity drug yeah that they can't get off of or yeah uh, 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 dialysis seventy two thousand dollars a year dialysis or heart attack hundred twenty you know what the average heart attack costs a hundred and twenty thousand dollars there's a, that's those huge incentives to keep us sick I'm not saying there's like a fiendish you know person you know behind the curtain but you have to follow the incentive the incentive of our health healthcare system is wait for people to get sick, mm-hmm. turn a blind eye to the things that's really making them sick, and then that's make the money thing. on trying to get them It's healthy. the turning the blind eye. It's the normalizing of health conditions and, and not pa- paying attention to the patterns and saying, well, why does everyone get breast cancer now? Why is that normalized? That shouldn't be normalized. Yeah. Like we should be figuring out what we have to do to stop this. You know, every, you, we talk about having a Starbucks on every corner. There's a new medical institution on every corner too. They're everywhere right now. The exactly. Yeah. So we are, the medical system isn't focusing their efforts on how do we heal and prevent? 
It's how do we prescribe and, and, and diagnose. And treat sickness. That's it. It's treating. It's not healing. Yeah. And so it's frustrating because no matter how much I love my doctors and, and I'm grateful, I also see the flawed system that they're a part of that they don't have control over. Everybody has to go to work and do their job, whatever you are, a lawyer, a doctor or whatever. Um, and it's, it's frustrating because you think about the marketing here that we get for candy and all this stuff that probably doesn't happen in those countries. So that's my next question. Are they being marketed to you by the Doritos of the world and all of these things? And are they eating any of that stuff ever? Traditionally, no. Unfortunately, in every blue zone, the American food culture has, has crashed into their culture and is paving over. I mean, I just came from Nicoya, Costa Rica, broke my heart. They just opened a McDonald's, you know, in this place. And, and that, that's the end of the blue zone. That's the beginning of the end of the blue zone. Oh, my God. But, you know, no. God, it's horrible. Well, I thought you and said I, the government and, was good. Why didn't they stop that? I know, like, certain towns... Back home in Boston, there's a town, Winchester, that my husband's from. They will not let fast food in. They are so adamant, and they will not let it in. I can't believe this government allowed it. I'm actually talking to them. I'm talking to the Minister of Tourism next week, and I'm going to try to get to the president and bring it up. You know, that's often municipal governments that uh, make those decisions. They are in the United States. But yeah, that's 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 they they're destroying a literally a, a worldwide treasure by you know a few greedy people who want to make money selling burgers and shakes and Coca Cola, um, but you know we should be clear, um, the pro it's doctors aren't bad. Doctors are taught to treat people. They're they they get very little education on nutrition, which by mm -hmm. the way that's why you shouldn't necessarily listen to a doctor when the doctor tells you what to eat because they don't know any more than you do, for example. Wait, no, Dan, that's um, my favorite is I went in for an endoscopy and a colonoscopy and they're like, oh, you have this gastritis situation, you have this, you have that. I'm like, okay. And I said, so what do I do? They're like, oh, we'll just see you in two years for your another follow-up. I go, wait, so you're going to wait till I have like cancer or something to kind of ha, tell ha, me what ha. to do? I said, that's please ridiculous. tell me, what do I do? I'm disciplined, I will do it. They don't know what to say. So that's when I was like, all right, yeah. I'm going to cut coffee. I'm going to cut all these things. I'm going to, anything that inflames, I'm going to cut. And then hopefully when I go back in two years, they can actually give me good news that all of this is healed, but they will never tell you anything nutrition wise. In fact, they might actually give you bad advice. Like our one doctor we had on the show, Dr. Christy Funk, she's top breast cancer surgeon. She was like, Maria, I have 15 minutes with a patient. I have to get an exam done and I have to get my paperwork done. And then as I'm running out the door, you're asking me what I can eat. I don't know what to tell you. She's like, sometimes I've even given bad advice because I wasn't sure. Then she went and did all the research like you did for this book, let's say. And she created the breast manual where she has everything you need to know about diet. And she's changed her and her family's diet because of it. But that's a rare doctor you're going to find that's actually invested the time to do all that research. That's right. And, um, you know, they, the a doctor, by the way, is going to read the same research you and, and I are going to read. Um, you know, the best doctors there, there, are, um, there is nutritionfacts.org, Dr. Michael Greger. I think that is the best source of the, you know, he's, he takes no advertising unbiased, um, fact. he wrote a book called how not to die, uh, different than the blue zones, but, uh, a great manual that in black and white tells you exactly um, what to eat and why it's good for you and what to avoid and why, why it will foreshorten your life. But, um, you know, in, in the blue zones, American kitchen, which just came out the, the first part of it, which also appeared in this month's national geographic, or actually it's last month now it's January. But uh, the, the, the reason we're in a place we are today 72% of Americans are obese or overweight. 72%, uh, not, everyone, I'm, hear that. 72%. Yeah. We're going to be at 100% three, very soon. We're on our way. Which, um, by the and, way, and that, Dan, and you probably know more about this than I do, that affects, I bet, 
what normal blood work is because they're comparing it to the average of everyone in America. So now the blood levels change. So now, you know, uh, 120 glucose level is probably normal where it's supposed to be under 90. I think you're, I think you're right. I think blood pressure, normal, the normal bottom threshold of blood pressure has gone up because of the new normal. You know, the rate of obesity has tripled in, in your lifetime. And, um, and, and, and it's, you know, it's, I don't think it's because I don't think it's Americans fault. You know, I think if you're overweight and unhealthy in America, it's probably not your fault because what happened the last 40 years, is that because Americans have less discipline or get less responsibility? No, we're the same people we were 40 years ago, but our environment has changed. You can't escape these cheap calories. So what happened? Well, not only can you not escape them, Dan, these, 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 um, chemists are working so hard behind the scenes to make the food addicting. Yes, it, you're right. Are not in uh. the business of making people healthy. They're in the business of selling food and, and making profit like every other company, like Apple or Google or whatever. So you can't really blame a company for doing what it's been set up to do. But our government could be making a difference. And the main problem, it all goes back to the agricultural bill, which subsidizes corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, and sugar beets. And the, the, those, since the 1970, Earl Butts, uh, Richard Nixon, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, incented farmers to grow these these grains, which are all used, they're the inputs for cheap livestock feed. So they're in the, out of the pastures and into these feedlots. And they're the, the, the building blocks of Doritos and cookies and, and crackers and, you know, the 72% of the food in grocery stores, which is junk. And, and it's just American ingenuity to take these cheap inputs uh, hire food scientists, which came on the scene in 1970, to make these cheap calories tasty and resistible. Spend another 15 billion or so a year hiring the sharpest minds in Madison Avenue uh, to to uh, convince us to eat them. You know, most of them with kind of false claims or misleading claims of this is omega three fatty acid, high protein, and then uh, and then flood the market. <laughs> yeah, I love these. when they try to tell parents, get your kids snackables. They're healthy. And you're like, yeah, well, they're just have sugar. you looked at the ingredients? Oh my God, I'm giving my kid death. <laughs> or Fruit Loops, which are, you know, 75% sugar or something like that, or simple carbs, fortified with essential vitamins. You know, it's like candy. Yes. It's like giving kids crack with some vitamins, you know? Yeah. It's just not... yeah. We'll probably get <laughs> there, yet, Dan. <laughs> but but our government does not have the courage uh, to say no to the lobbyists and to clearly label food. You go to Mexico, by the way, or you go to Chile, Mexico, by the way, where uh, you know we're so afraid of. Uh, they, if you buy a Coke, it says right on the front, big black letters, excessive calories, not a significant source of vitamins, uh, chips, excessive cal. They they tell you. And you can't escape it. Uh, junk food is clearly labeled. So mom's not, they're not bamboozled by some claim of, you know, fortified with vitamins uh, when it's junk. So that's yeah. what we need to do. And um, it can be done. It's just, it's just aiming at the right target. Yeah. It's, it's so depressing. And then I've also heard about all the spraying we're doing in the air. Do you know about that? Roundup? Is it Roundup that they're spraying in the air? I'm not familiar with that. Yet. Yeah, Dr. Zach Bush was talking to us about um, how much they're polluting the air and spraying. But the Roundup is awful too. There's so many class action lawsuits about it and then they're still using it everywhere. Yeah, and it's lacing our, it's laced throughout our food supply. We can't help but ingest it. That's a problem. And uh, it's it goes back to the agricultural bill because the... Farmers can't afford to grow organic because that there's no money. There's not enough money in it. There's not a good distribution chain. So 
um, you know, those are the things we have to have to pay attention to. So ever since that bill was was in effect in the 70s, what was the difference between then and now statistically? Well, the uh, percentage of our GDP spent on health care has gone from 6% to 18%, 4.2 trillion. Uh, obesity has tripled. Diabetes has gone up by a factor of seven. Um, dementia among people over 80 has gone up by a factor of nine. Um, you know, it's so easy to track the, the explosion in chronic disease and obesity and that farm bill in 1970. In fact, if you, if you, if you buy a, a, or if you pick up, get it from the library, the Blue Zone American Kitchen, I outline it very clearly, the very roots of how we got where we are today, and then a very clear prescriptive, here's how you get out of it. Here's how you step around this, mom, so you're not a victim of, of this. And, and uh, by the way, the, the, the value proposition for a 20-year-old woman uh, eating the Blue Zones way, which is essentially whole food plant-based, is about 10 years. And for a man, a 20-year-old man, it's 13 years. So you sit there, if you're a young person right now, somewhere between 10 and 13 years, uh, you could be living extra. And these are years without chronic disease. And even if you're 60 years old, it's still six years of life expectancy if you move away from the standard American diet towards the Blue Zone diet. And these are very well documented. And this isn't just Dan Buettner hyperbole, though I'm not above that. Uh, this <laughs> happens to be uh, evidence-based. But um, uh, so, um, yeah, so it's got 100 recipes to live to 100. I, I work with National Geographic uh, photographer David McLean. So I like to think it's like a, a, a coffee table book. It is. Uh, it's beautiful. We found that this, the, 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 Diets of longevity in America, not among Europeans, not among my ancestors, but it was the African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans living mostly between 1900 and 1940. So the diets I captured were the diets real Americans ate. I call it an alternative standard American diet. And then during the pandemic, we found 55 chefs, amazing chefs, who are historians in a way or they're deeply rooted in, in their culture, and they were able to bring this diet to life in a way that, you know, it's, I, I call it a maniacal focus on deliciousness. And um, it's, I, I'm, I'm proud to say over the weekend, it was the second best selling book in America. Uh, wow. It was ahead of Prince Harry. I think it's still one of the top 10 on Amazon right now. Congrats. You beat Prince Harry. That's awesome. I brought <laughs> Prince Harry. Yeah. Rumor you took has him down. He's going to do a, Rumor has it he's going to do a cookbook next. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. Yeah. You know what? I think it shows just how eager we are to be better. We just need the help. And that's why a book like this is so amazing, especially I, even for me right now, I I feel like I have a good foundation of healthy cooking in my life because of my mom, but recipes get old and you need new ones. And so Right now, where I've been so strict with my diet and so focused on healing and being strong and energetic, I am so excited to make so many of these recipes from, you know, all five blue zones, especially Thank the you. kale soba salad. Ooh, she looks good. Um, Dan, this was so informative and fun. Um, I am just so excited that you were the author of The Happiness Um uh, piece because I, I had that forever. It was so impactful. Well, thank you for that. The book the book I wrote, which expands that, is called The Blue Zones of Happiness. It took me 10 years working wow. with National Geographic. I think it's the best data-backed source of what you can actually do to stack the deck in favor of happiness. And if I didn't answer, I know a lot of your people are listening. If, if I didn't answer your question, uh, I can be reached at at Dan Butner on Instagram and I always answer questions. So, um, you know, I really appreciate the, the opportunity. I appreciate the people, you know, spent the last hour uh, listening to us. I know your time is valuable and I, I always consider it a great honor when I wish I could meet you face to face and Maria, you're just a bright light and uh, a, a shining star. And I, I hope you keep doing what you're doing.
All right. Well, I am so excited that we got to have Dan on the show because he's so funny and fun. That was so fun. I love him. But also, you know, we need to hear this. We need to hear that it is not normal that we are all, you know, racking up health conditions. And by the way, then you add COVID in and everything that that's done, but it's just not normal. And, you know, when you hear about what you know, bills were passed in the seventies and what they're doing to our food and the contamination that's not happening in other places. It really, it makes you wonder why we aren't protesting about that. Honestly. Well, and even the, like, I'm so glad you mentioned the corn thing. It's like, we're told one thing and Mm -hmm. then it becomes a truth and it's not even a truth, you know? So it's like, we have all these ideas in our head. It's like, don't eat this, eat this instead. Remember when, you know, the Beyond Meat and all those things became such a big thing and Mm -hmm. then people were like, this is so bad for you, everyone, but we were all told it was better. And so it's just like, you had to find the truth. So I'm so grateful Mm -hmm. that we have the show and you, you know, have these amazing conversations with these people because otherwise, how are people- How would we know? know? Did you eat corn or were you afraid of corn too? I was afraid of corn too. Mm -hmm. I literally wrote down, I'm going to go get those Trader Joe's tortillas (laughs) because I've been doing like, I've been paying, I pay so much money for the like- fancy tortillas that are like the grain-free almond flour ones like heck no now i'm going to get corn yeah Yeah. although i don't know if that's still good for your system i should probably ask dr allison before i do that but i feel like for you we just get a clean out clean out but yeah um but anyway friends i hope this was informative and helpful for you um if you haven't already by the way hold on let me move my mic and then you can see I'm wearing our Heel Squad shirt. So cute. And it is the softest, most amazing shirt ever. Um, So check it out at uh, mariamenunos.com. You can shop the merch collection there. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.